earlier that uh, I was going to say something about Israel before I get going and, and I and I am um, I, I don't, I don't want to sound like a conspiracy theory nut job or whack job I, I, I try to avoid going down those rabbit holes until I know that what I'm going to say is, is factual and, and truthful um, what I will say and what I've, I, I've observed and what I know about the current Israel situation has forced me to ask a couple of questions. Israel is arguably the most technologically advanced nation on the planet when it comes to their defense and their surveillance. Um, there is no more of a secure border on the face of planet Earth than the border between the Gaza Strip and Palestine and going into Israel. There is no more secure border on planet Earth. That's a fact, right? Um, I do know that on a daily basis, Palestinians do go into Israel for work. Um, they have to go through border checkpoints. They have to go through secure areas. There's a whole process of of getting into a country legally that we should maybe take note of here in the United States of America. But the fact is, is you cannot get into Israel without them knowing way far ahead where it is you're coming from and what your intentions are. They have surveillance that reaches all around that region that keeps eyes on everything around that region because they have to live that way. Israel has to live that way. It just is what it is. People want to destroy Israel. And so they have embedded all around the, that tiny little country from the north to the south, from the Mediterranean and to the east, surveillance systems and defensive measures that are second to none in this world. And why am I sharing that with you? How did yesterday happen if that's the case? How did it happen? How, how, how are they able basically just to walk in? How are they able to fly over? I'm telling you, I, I saw little single-engine paragliders with parachutes literally coming over their Iron Dome defense. How did this happen? I can't answer that for you. I, I don't know how it happened. I can, I can stir up and muster up some ideas. Maybe they let it happen. But there again, I'm going down a rabbit hole. What would be the reason why they would let it happen to their own nation? Ask yourself, why do we have open borders and why are we doing that to ourselves in this own nation? Right? Again, ask questions. Right? Here's what I do know. Biblically, regardless of how far away the nation of Israel has in the past fallen away from the Lord, and even today how far away they are from the Lord their God, they are still God's people. That's right. And they still will, and they still have and will always have God's hand around them. Regardless of, of how far away they are from the Lord, God's hand will always be around Israel. However, I will say this, because we can read it in our Bible, and I believe we saw it happening yesterday. God will allow Israel to be taken captive, and that is what happened yesterday. They, they literally took Israelis hostage yesterday, captive yesterday. God will allow people to invade Israel, to bring war into the, the country and onto the streets and into the homes of Israel for the sole purpose of, y'all need to turn back to me. Now is the time that you need to set your eyes on the, on the upward and see the glory of God. 
I, I'm afraid that Israel for t- far too long has been looking on the outward, has been boasting of itself, has been a very prideful nation, exalting itself even above, if they could, the Lord their God. And I believe that we are seeing right now just the beginning of the Lord beginning to get the attention of the nation of Israel. And the irony of the whole situation, folks, is it happened on the 50th anniversary to the day of the Six-Day War that took place on October 7th of 1973. 50 years to the day. I, my birthday will go down in history, at least in the nation of Israel. Right? But I, I want to make sure that as we begin to see news and headlines coming out of Israel, don't, don't believe them at face value. Especially if you're getting your news from any one of the major news stations, right? Go to your Bible to find out what's happening in Israel today. Because that will answer literally every question you have about what's going on in Israel today. And I believe the Bible is answering what happened yesterday. And it will continue to answer what Israel is doing in response to what happened yesterday. But pray for Israel. They've got to turn to, to, to their Lord. They've got to turn to their Lord. If if you've read the scriptures, the last three and a half years of the tribulation in the book of Revelation is all about Israel. And it's not good. It's not good. There's a whole lot of destruction. And there's a whole lot of devastation that is still yet to come to the nation of Israel. Again, for the sole purpose that they turn to the one true living God and believe in the Messiah, the only begotten Son of God, that came to them 2,000 years ago, whom they denied, rejected, and crucified. The tribulation is to get them to believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. And you can read that in the scriptures. I'm not making this stuff up, folks. I'm not saying to try to bring comfort to a terrible situation. It's in the scriptures. And so I just want to I, I just want to share that that those thoughts with you this morning about what's going on in Israel because we do need to pay attention. We do need to be aware because biblical um, and, and we certainly need to pray for the nation of Israel that they would turn to their God uh, because that is exactly what I believe God is doing today to get them to do that. And so um, with that being said, let, let me let me move on into the final message from John chapter 14 this morning. Um, you know, in, in my preparation for it, I, I didn't have a chance to do a proper sermon prep, if you will, on, on Friday morning. Uh, I, I was uh, blessed enough to be able to take my kids on a field trip to school on on a Friday morning. Uh, I don't usually do field trips with my kids' school, but this one was to my wife's work at the Palm Springs Art Museum. In the six plus years that she's worked there, I have never once been to her work. And in the six years before that, since I've lived here, I've never once gone to Palm Springs Art Museum. So I was able to knock out two birds with one stone on Friday. So I only did about an hour hour and a half of sermon prep on Friday. I did the majority of it yesterday morning. Um, but I believe that that this message, this sermon, is um, something that, that many of us need. And um, I'm the first one that needed it. I, I was sitting there doing my, my, my preparation and reading my notes and just reading this text over and over and over again and I realized how much I need today's message. You know, I was brought into remembrance of so much that the Lord has given to me. Um, and I believe that by the end of the morning, with two powerful points that I'm going to be sharing with you, that you'll be brought into remembrance as well of just what the Lord has given to each and every single one of us. I ask this morning... That you allow the Holy Spirit to minister to you. And I ask that you say a little prayer in your own heart. Surrendering yourself to the Lord this morning. That he may minister to you through this message in whatever area you need it to minister to to you today. The, the, The reality is every single one of us 
needs the comfort and needs the peace of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ every single day that we are blessed to have air in our lungs and feet to walk on this earth. Every single one of us need the peace and comfort of Jesus Christ. We may not realize it, we may not think about it, but we need it every single day. And so I ask this morning that you just surrender yourself to the Lord this morning and let this message work in you the way that you need it to work and the way that you want the Lord to have it work in you. Is this a perfect sermon? Absolutely not. This is not going to get me into the history books with Spurgeon and, and Graham and, and, and Wearsby, but this is a sermon that I need. And it's usually the sermons that I need that I am able to really drive home the points to the congregation that's sitting before me. Because I can get behind it because I need it. Not that I haven't needed any other sermon that I've preached, but boy, I'm telling you I needed this th this morning. And I need it right now. And I hope this morning that it makes the impact that, that it's intended to make but it can't do so, it's unable to do so, if we are closed off to the Holy Spirit being able to move in our lives, or if we're not surrendered to the Lord in whatever area we need His comfort and His peace. If there is an area in your life this morning that you need the comfort and the peace of God to come into, you have to surrender that area to the Lord and able to get the peace and comfort that He wants to offer you. But many of us, and I'm guilty of it, church family, in that area, I'm going to hold on to it because I can fix it and I can get through it and, and I can overcome it not remembering and acknowledging I can't do any of it, but the peace of God and the comfort of God can help me get through it. And so whatever area that is this morning in your life, whatever hurt, whatever trial, whatever tribulation, whatever grief, whatever agony, whatever sorrow, whatever area it is that you need the peace and comfort of God Almighty in your life, I implore you this morning to surrender that right now to the Lord. Stop holding on to it. Stop holding on to it. I haven't even started preaching and I'm already fired up. Thank you. With that being said, if you haven't already done so, open up your Bibles to the 14th chapter of the Gospel according to St. John and read with me verses 15 through 26. Verses 15 through 26 of uh, chapter 14. Jesus says this, If you love me, keep my commandments. And I will pray the Father, and he shall give you another comforter, that he may abide with you forever, even the Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it seeth him not, neither knoweth him, but ye know him. For he dwelleth with you and shall be in you. I will not leave you comfortless. I will come to you. Yet a little while, and the world seeth me no more, but ye see me, because I live, ye shall live also. At that day ye shall know that I am in my Father, and ye in me, and I in you. He that hath my commandments, and keepeth them, he it is that loveth me, and he that loveth me shall be loved of my Father, and I will love him, and will manifest myself to him. Judas saith unto him, not Iscariot, by the way, that's Judas who betrayed Jesus, Lord, how is it that thou will manifest thyself unto us, and not unto the world? Jesus answered and said unto him, If a man love me, he will keep my words, and my Father will love him, and we, we church family, will come unto him and make our abode with him. He that loveth me not, keepeth not my sayings, 
And the word which ye hear is not mine, but the Father's which sent me. These things have I spoken unto you, being yet present with you. But the Comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, whom the Father will send in my name, he shall teach you all things whatsoever I have said unto you. Church family, point number one, and I'm sharing it ahead of time, praise the Lord, is my comforter. My comforter. Bow your heads with me and pray. Heavenly Father, Lord God, as we begin to unpack this message, Father, as we begin to look at this first point, my comforter, Lord, as we begin to uh, look at the second point, uh, Lord God, uh, um, Lord, my peace. Father, I pray, as, as I've already mentioned, Lord God, that our hearts and our minds would, would be receptive and open and surrendered to receiving this message, Lord, in whatever manner of life that it needs to be received in right now, whether spiritually, whether physically, whether emotionally, whether physically, Lord, maybe all four, we need the peace and the comfort of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ in our lives right now. Father, I ask that you would move me aside. Father God, that you would have your way with these notes, with this sermon, with my words, that I would speak the very oracles of God this morning, and that you would use this vessel that I have surrendered to you and sacrificed to you for your glory and for your honor, Lord God. Bless the church family right now as they hear. I pray that you would bless those that are listening online. And Father God, that you would show favor and bless those that are going to hear this message later. May it have an equal impact then as it is right now in person. I ask and pray this right now in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. Jesus quickly has set the tone for the next section of teaching given to the disciples on his final night with a statement that is as relevant today as it was when it was spoken to the 11 that were left of the disciples. He says, if you love me, keep my commandments. Now, this wasn't merely a suggestion, church family. This was a call. This was a call that if you love the Lord your God, as we are commanded to in the scriptures, that we ought to keep his commandments. Now I know what you're saying because every Christian should, should ask this, at least when they're new Christians, how can I keep all the commandments of the Lord? It's impossible. And quite frankly, it is. That's why Romans 3.23, Paul writes, all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And if you go down the list of the Ten Commandments, every single one of us has broken all ten in some way, shape, or form, whether in thought, whether in deed, whether in action, or however you have broken them, you've broken them, and don't try to tell me you haven't, because you have. The idea behind keeping the commandments of God is to strive continuously to want to be obedient to the God who has given us so much and blessed us with his only begotten son and with everlasting life. But if you want to show your love to God, you keep his commandments. You obey his commandments. You strive to work towards keeping the commandments of the Lord. Now, from a practicality perspective, we don't just tell our spouses that we love them. I can sit here and tell them blow in the face and tell Leslie, I love you. I love you. I love you. I can tell God, Lord, I love you. But until I get busy showing Leslie that I love her, showing the Lord that I love her or love him, until I get busy doing it, my words, again, they're great to hear. My wife, my wife needs to hear that I love her, but my wife needs more for me to show her that I love her. Again, I can tell God I love him all day long, but God asks and he requires, quite, quite frankly, that we show our love for him through obedience to his word. It is vain to say, I love you, and not show that love or that affection you claim to have towards somebody. 
Your words are spoken in vanity. If you say you love them, but you don't show them you love them. And they're spoken in vanity. Until there is tangible evidence of that love, it's merely words without significance. And there's far too many words without significance going around today to allow love, arguably the greatest word in the English language, that word is far too important to be thrown around without any significance or weight behind it. And the significance and the weight that comes with that word should be through our actions and through our deeds. Now, I don't love Leslie because she tells me she loves me, even though she does, and it's nice to hear. I love her because she shows me that she loves me. Christ showed us his love on the cross at Calvary. Not mere words, but the greatest act of love and the greatest display of love ever shown to mankind. Christ showed us his love. Romans 5, 8, but God commended his love toward us, or God showed his love toward us, in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. And in similar fashion, Jesus tells us to show him our love for him through obedience. Jesus Christ was obedient unto death, obedient to the will of the Father, showing his love to the Father through going to the cross. And in like manner, Christ says, show me your love through obedience. Why? Because that's what I'm doing. And if we are going to be Christ-like, we ought to mirror and model and mimic, if you will, the life of Christ, a life of of, of obedience to the Father, a life of desire to do the will of the Father. But then we read in verse 16 something that is predicated on our love for the Lord Jesus Christ. Again, he says, if you love me, keep my commandments. And then he says, and. Folks, circle that word and in your Bible in verse 16. And. I will pray the Father, and he shall give you another comforter that he may abide with you forever. There is no way that you can read verse 16 without understanding the significance of the calling given to us in verse 15, which I believe verse 17 is going to prove in just a moment. 15, 16, and 17 are all one context that have to go together or none of it works. And I'll show you that in a moment. Church family, when Jesus says that he is going to pray for you on your behalf, I want to tell you right now, watch out. Don't watch out for something that's going to be terrible or, or bad. But when Jesus starts to pray for you, watch out. Because he and his name have the power to do things that only him and his name can do. And when he says that I will pray to the Father, I'm telling you folks, stand by. When Jesus prays, things happen. That's so good. Remember again what Jesus told Peter in Luke 22, verses 31 and 32 on the night of the Last Supper. He says, and the Lord said, in verse 31 of Luke 22, Simon, Simon, behold, Satan hath desired to have you, that he may sift you as wheat. He says, but I have prayed for thee, that thy faith fail not. And then Jesus says, and when... Thou art converted, strengthen the brethren. Jesus told Peter, 
I prayed for you that your faith would be strengthened. And then Jesus tells Peter, and when you're done, not if you get done, not maybe if you can do it. He says, and when you're converted, when the devil is done sifting you, he goes, go strengthen the brethren. Jesus, when he prays, whatever he prays, it happens. It's not a prayer that's thrown up to God the Father in the hopes that it will happen. When Jesus prays, folks, things happen. They don't fall on deaf ears. They don't sit there idly. Now, for a season, we may certainly be waiting for the prayer to be answered. But I'm telling you, when Jesus prays, prayers get answered, church family. That's how it works. And Jesus' promise to those that love him and to those that keep his commandments is that he will pray to the Father and the Father will send the Comforter to abide with us forever. He says, if you love me, keep my commandments. And I will pray to the Father and we will send you a Comforter that will abide with you forever. Now remember, this was originally written in the Greek. And when you break down the Greek word for comforter, which is the word parakletos, you're going to get a range of meanings from attorney or advocate. That's, an, that's a definition of, of comforter. Uh, another definition of comforter is an assisting helper. Or... This is a good one, an encouraging friend. Jesus fills all of those descriptions and definitions of the word comforter. He is our attorney. He is our advocate. He is our assisting helper. He is our encouraging friend. All of which, again, I believe are befitting of the ministry of the Holy Spirit in our lives. God has a unique way of when you need an attorney or an advocate on your behalf, what does he do? He provides one. He is in the business of when you need a helper, he sends one. He is in the business of when you need an encouraging friend, he sends one. And it may be just the Holy Spirit filling you up and, and providing for you what you need in your life, just him and you. But oftentimes, man, he uses others. He uses others to be your advocate. He uses others to be your helper. He uses others to be your friend. But it's all from God and from the Holy Spirit. We then see Jesus called the Comforter the Spirit of Truth in verse 17. Now, why is the Holy Spirit called the Holy or the Spirit of Truth? Well, we just read a couple of weeks ago in John 14, 6, that Jesus is the truth. And so, if the Holy Spirit, which is one with God the Father and one with His only begotten Son then the Holy Spirit needs to be a spirit of truth because Jesus Christ is truth. But we also know that throughout the Gospels and in the book of Revelation, the prince of this world, Satan, is referred to as a deceiver, a liar, and the father of lies. Church family, if you didn't know it yet, there are demonic spirits everywhere. There are seducing spirits. There are murdering spirits. There are lying spirits. And this is all out of the Bible. Folks, there are demonic spirits going on right now at the Empire Polo Fields this weekend if you don't know what's going on. I'm telling you straight up. I've seen pictures of what's going on there. I've never seen more, more people dressed up like devils. More shirts and signs and banners with pentagrams on them. 
More satanic worship going on out there than going on this weekend out there at the Empire Polo Fields. So I'm telling you, five years ago, I'd have been out there myself. But I'm convicted. I, I can't go out there. And I know the Lord ain't going to call me out there unless it's my job. But man, pray for us. He's been out there all weekend long having to deal with this nonsense. But I'm telling you, there are demonic spirits and seducing spirits and lying spirits and, minute and murdering spirits all around and all throughout the scriptures. And nothing's changed from the scriptures to today. To today. But they are all characterized by darkness and deception. And in brilliant contrast to the darkness of the realm of the great deceiver... Because that's what Satan is. He's the great deceiver. God's spirit is truth characterized by what? Truth. Right? You see, Jesus can't be the truth and the Holy Spirit not be in harmony as the spirit of truth. The truth is revealed to us through the Holy Spirit of God, the Spirit of Truth. By divine revelation, our hearts, at some point in all of our lives, were opened up to the truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ. In so much so that we believe in all of our hearts that what this Bible is saying is 100% truth. And that is only revealed through the spirit of truth. If you don't have the spirit of truth in you, church family, this is going to be hogwash. The preaching of the cross is going to be foolishness. But the spirit of truth, the Holy Ghost, has revealed to us the truth that is in the Lord Jesus Christ. Moreover, this is something that is the spirit of truth that the world cannot receive. The world cannot receive the spirit of truth. I had shared earlier that verse 16 is predicated upon verse 15 and that verse 17 is going to confirm that. I hope you're tracking. I, hope, I really hope you are. Jesus says... Because you have not seen him nor known him, you cannot receive the Holy Ghost. Scores and scores and multitudes upon multitudes of people are walking around today and have throughout all of history apart from the Holy Ghost. Apart from the Holy Spirit of God. That is why Jesus says in Matthew chapter 7, Broad is the way and wide is the gate that leadeth to destruction. But narrow is the way and straight is the path that leadeth to everlasting life. I want you to think about it. If you've ever, draw, if you've ever driven on I-5 in San Diego, I know a couple of you have. If you're driving south on I-5... There's a point where the I Interstate 5 freeway splits and then the 805 freeway takes you all the way down into uh, uh, San Ysidro, the border. You take the 805 all the way down. But at this split, there is literally, I think, 12 lanes of highway that are splitting off into two different freeways. It is broad and it is wide. And I'm telling you, you can fit... Tens of thousands of cars an hour in this 12-lane highway in San Diego County. Every hour, tens of thousands, scores and scores and scores of cars. But I tell you what, man, if you're on a little podunk country road that's only one way, and you got a slow tractor in front of you, and you got rows of semis coming down the other. All of us, I'm, I've been on these roads before, folks. There is literally only one straight path that you can go down. And by the way, the moment you think you can get off that path, what are you doing? You're getting head on into a semi truck or another hay tractor. 
<laughs> my, my point is, hello, if you've driven out to Cibola, Arizona, my point is this. Sure, it's easy to go down Interstate 5 on 12 lanes of highway. It's easy. It's fast. You can get there quickly. But I'm telling you, because the Word of God says that will lead you to destruction. Folks, stay on the country road. Come on. Stay on the country road. It's worth the drive. It's worth the trip. I agree. Again, if you haven't received the Holy Ghost, it's because Christ has not prayed to the Father to send it to you. Remember, verse 16, and I will pray to the Father and we will send it to you. But if you have not received it, this world has not received it because Christ has not prayed to the Father to send it to them. And if Christ has not prayed to the Father to send it to them, it's because they don't love the Lord and they don't keep his commandments. Folks, have you seen? I've backed this all up for you. I've backed it all up so that you can see that the only way that you can receive the Holy Ghost is to love the Lord and to strive to keep His commandments so that you can have the intercessory prayer of Jesus Christ to God so that they can send you the Holy Spirit. It's all predicated. There, there, there's, there, there's, a, there's a, 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 a line, if you will, that is required to be met, requirements that need to be met in order to receive the Holy Ghost. But it starts, church family, with loving the Lord your God. Because when you love God, when you genuinely love God, guess what's going to come naturally? In fact, supernaturally, your desire to obey him. Your desire to strive to be obedient. And when we do that, we know we have the prayers that we have asked of him. <laughs> the world that chooses not to see him and not to know him aren't given the blessing of prayer by the Savior of the world, Jesus Christ. Folks, I don't know about you. I need Jesus praying on my behalf. I need it. I can't live a day without it. How shameful and how pitiful that this world does not know what it is losing out on by not having the prayers and the petitions of the Savior of the world. But those that are, those that are given the blessing of prayer by Jesus Christ, we are given the promise that He will not Folks, he will not leave us comfortless. That's so good. He will not leave us comfortless. I love the fact that even though Jesus Christ left this earth, he has not left us orphaned. He hasn't left us to our own devices. He hasn't left us without a father. He hasn't orphaned us but has provided to us the gift of the Holy Spirit so that in his absence, before he returns, we may continue in the bond of fellowship with the Father that Christ came to establish during his earthly ministry. That's exactly what the Holy Spirit does. Christ reestablished the bond with the Father when Christ's work was done and he ascended to the throne of God, the Holy Spirit was sent to us to continue and maintain that relationship that Christ established during his earthly ministry. And it's that bond of fellowship and our love for the Lord that continues to grow. And in that growth, our desire to obey him grows. And through that... Jesus tells us in verse 21 that in our love for Christ, we receive the love of the Father and the love of the Son. We receive the love of the Father and the love of the Son. 
Now listen, I know, I know that God's love is unconditional. I know that his love never changes. I know that he loves me as much as he loves those who hate him. I don't understand that. I cannot fathom that. The fact that he loves a man like Charles Spurgeon the same way he loves a man like Adolf Hitler is beyond my scope of understanding. But God loves a man like Billy Graham as much as he loves a man like Adolf Hitler. I, I don't get it, but it's the love of God. That's why he's God and we're not. Right? right? But it's those who are obedient through love to his commandments that receive the reward of the Holy Ghost and of everlasting life. Because Adolf Hitler chose to live the life that he did and do the things that he did. And I would assume, I don't know his final minutes, but I assume denied the Lord Jesus Christ because Adolf wanted to be his own God. He wanted to be God. That never diminished God's love for him. It, it, it never diminished it. it. God's love was never taken away from him at any point. But what Adolf Hitler missed out on was the ability to be in fellowship with God through the Holy Ghost. What a tough life. And it, it, it is a tough life. The book of Proverbs, I forget where it is, but I know it says it in there. The ways of a transgressor are hard. The ways of a sinner, man, it's difficult. It's not the life that God has created us to live. That's right. That's right. He's created us to live in fellowship with him. That's what Jesus Christ did for you and I. He restored that fellowship. And we have that fellowship today with him through the Holy Ghost. Now, again, it doesn't change his love for a guy like Hitler that didn't receive those rewards that we've received, but it certainly does separate the wheat from the chaff and the sheep from the goats. The Holy Ghost separates the two. You either have it or you don't. Then we see Judas, again, not the betrayer, ask Jesus a question. He says in verse 22, Lord, how is it that thou will manifest thyself unto us and not unto the world? The answer is short. In that those who receive the manifestation of the Holy Spirit also have the promise of the Holy Spirit dwelling in them. Forever. The promise of the Holy Spirit dwelling in you. I love that. Paul would write in 1 Corinthians 3.16, speaking to the church, by the way. I want you to know Paul's audience. Paul's audience is the church at Corinth. He says in 1 Corinthians 3.16, Know ye not that ye are the temple of God and that the Spirit of God dwelleth in you? Do you not know this morning, church family, that your bodies are literally the temple of God and that the Spirit of God dwells in you? Folks, I don't know about you, but that's a convicting verse sometimes to read because there are some things in me that I would be ashamed of. Knowing that the Lord God himself, his Holy Spirit, dwells in me. And he says in verse uh, uh, 19, just a few chapters later in chapter 6, he says, what? Know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost which is in you, which ye have of God, and ye are not your own? Listen, there's this huge movement amongst these wackadoodles in the abortion industry. My body, my choice. Get over it. Jesus Christ says through divine revelation, 
to the Apostle Paul that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost which you have of God and you are not your own. So no, my body, my choice. God is the owner of your body. If you have surrendered yourself to the Lord Jesus Christ and the Holy Ghost dwells in you, you are the Lord's and your body is the Lord's. And that is why it is so convicting that we watch what it is we put into our body, what it is that we consume, what it is that we eat, what it is that our eyes see, what it is that we open our minds to, what it is that we touch from head to toe. It's so convicting. We have to be so careful. Why? Because the Holy Ghost, the Holy Spirit of God, He dwells in us. This is His temple. And all our temples look different. I don't like the way my temple looks, but it still belongs to the Lord. But we've got to be careful what we consume and what we put into our life. Church family, meditate on that. The Holy Ghost dwells in you. That is why the conviction of sin must be ever present in our lives. That is why we must flee fornication and flee youthful lusts. That is why we must resist the devil. That is why we must rebuke the lust of the eyes and, and the lust of the flesh and the pride of life. That is why we must guard our hearts with all diligence. That is why the desire to seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness must be a daily pursuit in our lives. That is why we must increase and he must increase. In, uh, we must decrease and he must increase. That is why denying ourselves and picking up our crosses daily is a requirement to be a disciple of the Lord Jesus Christ. That is why, according to our text, we must love him and keep his commandments. Why? Why all of that? Because he dwells in us. And if you want to be in harmony, and in sync with your heavenly Father, hmm. you must surrender to the Holy Spirit of God that dwells in all of our lives. Jesus makes it very clear that if we keep not his saints, it is because we love him not. You cannot argue with that. But if we do, church family, we have the promise that the Comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, will teach us all things and bring all things to remembrance whatsoever the Lord has said. Point number two, my peace. My Comforter, point number one, my peace, point number two. Let me finish out chapter 14. I'll read verses 27 through 31. He says, Peace I leave with you, my peace I give unto you, not as the world giveth, give I unto you. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. Ye have heard how I said unto you, I go away and come again unto you. If ye loved me, ye would rejoice, because I said, I go unto the Father, for my Father is greater than I. And now I have told you before it come to pass, that when it is come to pass, ye might believe. Hereafter I will not talk much with you, for the prince of this world cometh and hath nothing in me, but that the world may know that I love the Father, and as the Father gave me commandment, even so I do. He tells his disciples, Arise, let us go hence. My peace. Church family, if you are seeking peace today from any other source, any other person, any other outlet beside the Lord Jesus Christ, your attempts at finding peace are being done in vain. 
You are wasting your time trying to find peace in anything else outside of the Lord Jesus Christ. Your self-help books, your psychiatric prescriptions, your empty bottles, your gurus, your holistic healings, your meditations, they are all of the devil. All of them. All of them are of the devil. They are of this world and every single thing that promotes peace outside of the Holy Scriptures is intended to draw you away from the very thing that promises you a peace that is like nothing that this world can offer. You want to know why people cannot find peace in prescriptions? Why people cannot find peace in self-help books and empty bottles and holistic healings and all the other nonsense that this world offers? Because it can't. It cannot provide the peace that Jesus Christ offers you and I. His peace settles us to the very depths of our hearts. His is the only peace that can settle our hearts. And that is why he says in verse 27, let not your hearts be troubled, neither let them be afraid. Why? Because my peace will sustain you. My peace that I've come to give to you will give you cause to not fear, nor have trouble, nor be afraid. And again, this is not merely a suggestion, but it's an imperative. It's a commandment to let your hearts not be troubled. Church family, Jesus is the Prince of Peace. Isaiah tells us he's the Prince of Peace, the Everlasting Father. And only the Prince of Peace can give the peace that Paul talks about in Philippians 4, 8, a peace that surpasses all understanding. Only Jesus Christ can do that. Jesus not only knew what laid ahead for him and his disciples that night, but he knows what lies ahead for you and me, and he gives us clear direction. Knowing what lays ahead, he gives us clear direction to not be afraid of it, but to let his peace be received to guide us through it. You see, Jesus says, my peace I give unto you. If you give something to somebody, it's got to be received. Many of us, Jesus is wanting to throw his peace at us. Take my peace, have my peace, I'm giving you my peace. But many of us aren't receiving it. Many of us aren't accepting it. Why? Because we're turning to these worldly things to find peace. We're thinking that, hey, listen, I got this. I can get through this. I'll find peace sometime other. Jesus says, no, I want to give it to you now. My peace I give to you. Not as the world gives. There's no way that I am here today without his peace. There's no way that many of you, if not all of you, are here today without his peace. That peace and that comfort that he's promised us throughout our text this morning is so that we can find him in times of distress. We can find him in times of peril, in times of famine, in times of mourning, in times of weeping, in times of fear, in times of dismay. There is nothing apart from his peace that can guide us through these times like he can. There's nothing apart from his peace that can guide you through it like he can. Then he reminds his disciples to rejoice in the fact that he is going to his father. I got to be honest with you. If I was one of his disciples that night and he told me to rejoice in the fact that he was going away, I'd say, are you crazy? You're leaving and you want me to rejoice? 
He tells his disciples to rejoice. And, and maybe, maybe Jesus perceived some of the trouble that was beginning to stir in their hearts. And although they would not fully understand it until later, he tells them to remember what he has said and to rejoice in it. Remember what the Lord has said and rejoice in it, my brother. Are you hearing me? Remember what the Lord has said and rejoice in it, church family. Sometimes the only rejoicing we have is from the Word of God. In seasons of dismay, in seasons of sadness, in seasons of discouragement, in seasons of depression, the only thing that has brought rejoicing to my life is the Word of God and the reminders that are in it. Peter would write in 2 Peter chapter 1, Verses 12 through 15, Wherefore, I will not be negligent to put you always in remembrance of these things, though ye know them and be established in the present truth. Listen, Peter's saying, listen, you may be aware of the scriptures. You may know them, but Peter says, I'm still going to remind you of them. Folks, you come to church on Sundays, some of you go to Bible studies midweek, and you probably have heard a sermon before on these verses. You've read them yourself. You've been a part of a Bible study that has studied this very thing. But if that's the case, can the pastor take the day off? Well, shoot, you guys probably already read John 14. I'm out of here. No. Peter, Peter, being the pastor that he was, says, y'all might know this, but I'm still going to remind you of it. He says, yeah, I think it meet or I think it necessary, as long as I am in this tabernacle, this body, to stir you up by putting you into remembrance. Peter said, listen, while I'm still alive, it's my job to stir you up by putting you into remembrance of what the Word of God says. He says, knowing that shortly I must put off this tabernacle, even as the Lord Jesus Christ has shown me. He knew he was going to die. He says, the Lord showed me I'm going to die. He says, soon I'm going to die. This tabernacle is going to go away. This body's going to be dead. But as long as I'm here, I'm going to encourage you. I'm going to remind you. I'm going to stir you up in your faith. He says in verse 15, moreover, I will endeavor that ye may be able after my decease to have these things always in remembrance. In other words, when I'm gone, don't forget what the Word of God says. When I depart this tabernacle, when this body's no longer here, when I'm not preaching at church on Sunday, church family, don't forget what the Word of God says Bring yourselves continuously into remembrance of the promises of God. The importance of remembering these things cannot be stressed enough this morning, church family. And like Peter, as so long as I am in this tabernacle, that is this body, I too will strive to put you into remembrance of these things as often as I can. It is my duty and it is my mission to encourage you, church family, in the scriptures. I have nothing to offer you in the way of encouragement than what this word of God says. Because ultimately, for you, that's all that's going to matter. That's all that's going to matter. Anything spoken outside of the word of God as a means of encouragement or peace, as I stated earlier, is done in vain. Yeah. Jesus then wanted the disciples to understand that this all was foreknown to him and foreordained by God. He says in verse 29 that when it come to pass, ye might believe. We know that 
what would take place in the hours that lay ahead for Jesus would place catastrophic stress on the faith of the disciples. They would see their Lord arrested. They would see their God taken to a, 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 a trial that was just a mock trial at best, kangaroo court at best. They would see him crucified on the cross after being beaten within an inch of his life. You want to talk about stress on your faith? That's going to do it to you. How many of us, and I don't want to see your hands because I know the answer, have experienced stress on our faith lately? Extreme stress, catastrophic stress on our faith. Jesus says, let me remind you of what I've said. Let me encourage you. It was the teachings and the foretellings of Jesus to his disciples and now passed down to you and I that would be able to strengthen us and them to overcome the challenges that lay ahead. If it was not the reminders that Jesus gave them, they probably would have just fallen over in their faith, given it up, walked away. I can't do this. But the more we open this book, the more we hear this book preached, the more we study the Word of God, the more we're brought into remembrance of what it says through and through. It strengthens us when we experience catastrophic stress on our faith. This is a source of strength for our faith to guide us through the road that lays ahead for you and for I. And in the final verse, verse 31, Jesus summarized his entire earthly presence of why he had come. He would obey his Father in the ultimate act of obedience on the cross. It would prove his love for God. It would be an undeniable testimony to the world of his love for the Father and for you and for me. And with holy resignation, motivated by that love, Jesus now begins to head to the cross at Calvary. He tells his disciples at the end of verse 31, Arise, let us go hence. And it appears that the journey to Calvary that night via Gethsemane was now starting. It was at this point, church family, that I believe the walk leaving the upper room and the walk to Gethsemane has started because he says, arise, let's go. It was time for them to begin the journey to the cross. I shared two points with you this morning, church family, my comforter and my peace. Both, I believe, most of us can probably use right now. My encouragement to you this morning is this. Love God and keep his commandments. That's it. That's it. Love God and keep his commandments. That is a sure fire way to not only get Jesus to pray on your behalf, but with it, the promise of comfort and peace incomparable to anything in this world. I pray this morning that this resonates with you and ministers to you exactly where you have needed it to. Amen, church family? Amen. Well, pray with me. Heavenly Father, Lord God, in, in, uh, in this time, in this season, in these days, Father God, with so much going on, Lord, spiritually, Father God, personally, professionally, Lord, physically, emotionally, mentally, politically, Lord, with so much turmoil, with so much chaos, with so much discouragement around us, Father God, I am so thankful today that we have the promise of the Comforter, the Holy Spirit of God to those that love you and to those who desire to keep your commandments, Father God. And I would pray that the Comforter this morning, Lord, would bring that peace 
that surpasses all understanding to keep our hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Father God, I know that there are church family before me right now, listening right now, that are going to listen later, that need the Comforter, the Holy Ghost, present in their lives. And so I ask and pray right now in the mighty name of Jesus that you would show yourself strong, show yourself mighty, and show yourself faithful to those that love you and to those who desire to keep your commandments. And we know that all things will work together for good to them that love God and to them who are the called according to his purpose. And I thank you, Heavenly Father, that you have loved us and that you have called us. And Father God, I would ask right now that our hearts and that our minds would be focused on loving you, on keeping your commandments, so that we may get the petitions that are required and necessary in our lives of God through Jesus Christ, Lord. I pray for your blessings over this church family, over Revelation Church and its ministries, Lord, and just continue to ask for your favor as we depart today. It is in the mighty name of Jesus I pray. Amen. 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 No. That's a great.